It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Roy Perlis for uh, the, the next talk. Um, we usually don't have fancy introductions, but we've been collaborating for a while. You get to learn a lot of cool things about people. I remember that uh, in a couple of years we started collaborating, and Roy mentioned he was learning Icelandic. And I was like, I'm just learning how to pronounce, like, Emily trips me up on the tongue every single time. Um, but, you know, now I can pronounce all sorts of antidepressants, like amylotryptyline, um, and Roy will give the talk at Icelandic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, actually, two languages I'm not going to speak today. I'm not going to speak Icelandic, and there will be no math. I feel like I should pause briefly while people run for the exits. No, really, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Very much appreciate uh, the invitation. I appreciate Finale's um, kind introduction. Um, what I want to focus on for the next 30 or 40 minutes are sort of controversial topics in major depression, which is an area where I've worked for 25 years. Um, but more generally, I hope people will be able to take away from this that you really should think about working on psychiatric illness, uh, that it's a really tractable problem, but that you do need to be thoughtful in the kinds of problems that you work on, which may not be the obvious ones. Uh, as a physician, I always start by disclosing uh, conflict of interest. So. These are the sorts of companies that I work with, mostly on trying to make new therapeutics for major depression and related diseases. Um, maybe a more interesting disclosure, though, is this one, uh, where I, I feel I should tell you that about 2.5% of my DNA is of Neanderthal origin. I'm a geneticist. That's interesting to me. But I do actually think there's a point to be made here about being sure that when we present quantitative data, to people that it's quantitative data that they know what to do with, that, that, that has some relevance to them. And it's a little bit of a cautionary tale. In genetics, we've been trying now for many decades to find disease genes, but we have a lot of work to do in translating that to actionable clinical information. But that's a talk for another time. I should tell you that major depressive disorder, if you didn't know it already, is a hard research problem. The first grant I ever submitted to work on machine learning, uh, and I should disclose that I'm a survivor of the AI winter, uh, so this was uh, eight plus years ago, and the, the proposal goes in and the review comes back and says, this would be really of great interest, this is very innovative and interesting, but you should apply it to a more tractable problem like diabetes. Not what you want to read. I'm a psychiatrist. This is, these are the diseases I, I work on. Um, and I hope that these are diseases that some of you will consider working on as well if you're not already. So sometimes we say that no family is untouched. Uh, the lifetime risk of major depression is between 15 and 20 percent, uh, more common in women, interestingly. Um, Almost everyone sitting in the audience has either experienced it themselves or has a family member or a friend. Um, it has both direct and indirect contributions to mortality. It has massive contributions to morbidity, to functional impairment, uh, to lost productivity. But if you're going to work on depression, make sure you're working on problems that will help patients. And I want to talk about three controversies in particular, three controversial topics in depression that I, I hope will sort of catalyze people to think about this area. The first is diagnosis. The second is decision making about treatment or precision medicine. And the third is prediction of mortality. So one barrier to studying depression, something that gets in our way, ironically, is how familiar it is. So nearly everyone has had the experience of feeling lousy for some period of time or knows people who've had that experience. And I think that leads us to make errors of generalization, right? Uh, my PhD wasn't going well and I felt lousy. I didn't need medicine. I just needed to switch topics or switch PIs or switch schools, right? Um, you know, I felt lousy and I started exercising and that did it for me. And I think this is an area where one-shot learning is probably not so ideal. I, I think you really want to recognize that in depression, as much as any disorder, there's a huge variability in people's experience of it. And often, when people are concerned about should we be treating it, should we, uh, is, is it just a natural human state, they're not considering the broad spectrum of severity of this illness, which 
can really impair people's existence for months, years, um, and potentially even a lifetime. So, a few basic facts to get us on the same page. The diagnosis of major depression is uh, canonically done by a structured clinical interview. The abbreviation is the SCID. And a full SCID done by a clinician can take uh, on the order of two hours, depending on, obviously, the, the patient and the clinician. Uh, the mood modules, the part that are focused on diagnosing depression, takes an experienced clinician about 20 to 30 minutes. And with the prior diagnostic criteria yields a kappa of about 0.68, which people consider to be good but not great. So reasonably reliable criteria by clinical standards. Interestingly, in the DSM-5, in the new iteration of our diagnostic system, the kappa has become much worse. We've actually become less reliable in diagnosing depression. I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a few minutes. What I think is critical to understand are not the individual criteria, you can Google them, you're probably familiar with them, but that we require that these have persisted for at least two weeks. We require associated symptoms that don't just reflect mood. And critically, we, we require that there be some functional impairment or distress. So when people get very bent out of shape on hacker news about how we're throwing pills at everything, we're throwing treatments at people who are impaired or distressed by their symptoms. Okay, I think that's an important distinction. Now, in clinical practice, people don't generally do a full structured interview. It takes uh, far longer than is feasible, but we do tend to assess in a systematic way the same sets of features to make a diagnosis. Parenthetically, this is very much the way that one approaches, for example, cardiac ischemia in the emergency room, right? We ask about the nature of the pain, we ask about associated symptoms, precipitants, how long it's been going on. The difference in cardiac ischemia is, of course, that we have troponin and we have EKGs and we have imaging modalities. And so when you think about how we diagnose depression, I would consider it's not that we don't want to have a gold standard, it's that we don't yet have a gold standard. The tissue of interest is hard to access in living people. My patients don't like getting brain biopsies, right? So instead, we have what you might call a silver standard. We have a set of criteria which have proven to be reasonable, reli reasonably reliable, which let us make predictions about someone's course over time and what's likely to work. Since there's still a fair amount of skepticism about these diagnoses, though, I, I should also tell you that even the silver standard in psychiatry, even this criteria-based diagnosis, identifies for us phenotypes that are strongly heritable. Um, and the heritability for depression is in the 30 to 40 percent range. For schizophrenia, can be as high as 80 percent, right? And, and what I mean by heritability is the a proportion of risk uh, that is accounted for by heritable factors. Now, to put that in some context, that makes these diseases in general more heritable than breast cancer in the range of type 2 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. And those are diagnoses that are made with a, gold st with a biological gold standard, whereas we're making the diagnosis with clinical criteria. So there is a perception that psychiatric illness is somehow fuzzier or that we made it up. It is fair to say that these are made up criteria, but they actually turn out to be reasonably reliable and reasonably predictive. And in fact, using these working definitions, we were able to identify a few years ago the first 15 regions of genome associated with major depression. We're up to about 40 regions of genome in most recent studies about 300 plus regions of genome for schizophrenia. The point is, as much as we would love to have a gold standard, our silver standard has worked reasonably well so far, at least in terms of identifying biology. But we should acknowledge as a group that there are still some problems with this diagnosis. And one of them is that, admittedly, major depression is a, an incredibly heterogeneous disorder. Uh, don't remember the calculation, but this huge range of presentations that all get lumped into major depression. This, of course, doesn't really distinguish it from type 2 diabetes, cancers, vasculopathies, where we probably also lump together many diseases under a rubric of a disorder. And I think an important area of investigation is how do we distinguish these subgroups and dimensions? 
by way of warning, people have been trying to find depressive subtypes or subgroups for many decades. There's been a cottage industry of maybe this kind with anxiety is different or this kind with melancholic features is different. But that doesn't mean that new and more clever approaches will help us tease out um, differences among uh, depressive disorders. I think the other problem beyond heterogeneity is what you might call dimensionality. So when people get worried about overdiagnosis of depression, often what they're talking about is that we are taking what is a continuous trait in some ways into a categorical one. We are calling a particular degree of symptoms disease. So when you've felt depressed and had associated symptoms for one week, what do you have? Right? Or when you only have three features of depression and we're requiring that you have four, what do you have? Again, I would submit to you that this is not necessarily a deal breaker for rigorous science. And by analogy, we have exactly the same problem in hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, where indeed the definition of the disorder, the cut point where we take this continuous measure and decide this way is disease, uh, has changed over time. And so in thinking about depression, recognizing that we're left with a heuristic, with a set of rules, we should think about what is the set of rules that gets us to a diagnosis where treatment is likely, uh, the benefit of treatment is likely to exceed risk. Um, just to reinforce the point about dimensions and heterogeneity, I wanted to highlight a little work by my colleague Tom McCoy, uh, published a few years ago, where we said, look, the diagnostic codes for major depression are not telling us very much about the heterogeneity of the illness. It turns out that applying NLP to narrative notes, you can learn much more about the features of this illness that differ from patient to patient. So this shows you the distribution of particular features of depression, in this case, uh, negative uh, valence or uh, depression, anxiety kinds of symptoms and cognitive symptoms on admission to a psychiatric inpatient unit and then on discharge. So the broader point is, yes, we're taking continuous measures and dichotomizing them for the purpose of making a diagnosis, but to some extent we can regenerate those dimensional features using things like notes. And still, we want reliable diagnosis and we would love a biomarker. So what if I told you I have a biomarker for you that takes less than five minutes to collect, less than 10 cents at each collection, has a sensitivity and a specificity each of about 88%. This is pretty good. You'd be excited about this. I'm gonna license this genetic test. I'm gonna implement this algorithm. People get very excited until they hear that this is a nine item screen. This is something called the PHQ-9, used originally in primary care as a screen for depression. The reason that I show this to you is to say, don't necessarily get caught up in our rules, our approaches, our biologies have to be complex to be useful. This is actually an incredibly useful screen and I would submit to you that almost every month I get a paper to review uh, at JAMA Open that says something like, we have a better way of diagnosing depression. And it has a sensitivity and a specificity that aren't even as good as this nine item depression screen. So newer is not necessarily better. And more generally, we're pretty good at screening for depression in primary care. And to the extent we're not good at it, it has less to do with a lack of tools and much more to do with a lack of will and challenges of implementation and lots of things that I think are out of scope for our discussion. The real diagnostic problem in MDD, if you want to improve how we think about MDD, you need to think instead about how do we distinguish it from mimics or phenocopies, things that look like depression but are really something different. And so for example, a major challenge in diagnosis of major depression is that there are a subset of people who actually have bipolar disorder. So not only depressive episodes, but depressive and manic episodes or hypomanic episodes. And if I treat those people with an antidepressant, there is a real risk of iatrogenic injury. I may make them worse rather than better. We don't have great ways of distinguishing major depression from bipolar. We don't have any biomarkers. And this, in my opinion, is an important area of research because right now we've done enough education that primary care docs are afraid to start someone on an antidepressant because they're afraid they're gonna 
pitch them into bipolar disorder. And we need ways of stratifying who is at higher and lower risk. Lots of other phenocopies as well, though. A favorite topic for letters in the New England Journal is the stupid psychiatrist treated this guy for depression for two years and ignored his pancreatic cancer, right? Stupid psychiatrist did this for, you know, had them on five different antidepressants, they didn't work, and it turned out they had thyroid disease. So I think an underappreciated opportunity in the field, an area where we need tools is figuring out among people with depression or who present with depressive symptoms, how do we identify the folks who need to be imaged, who need a workup for cancer, who need a workup for dementia in an efficient way? Um, so food for thought. Uh, this is just an illustration of the sort of work we're trying to do using very simple uh, classification approaches. It's work by Melanie Predier and Finale and, and others where we're simply asking when someone comes to the clinic and gets an antidepressant. So it might be the primary care doc who diagnosed, it might be the psychiatrist. When that first antidepressant prescription is written, can we identify who is at high risk for a subsequent course consistent with bipolar disorder? As a way of saying it's not that I need to screen better in primary care, it's that I need to be better about screening who is at high risk for a must not miss diagnosis like bipolar. All right, talked about diagnosis, let's move on to treatment. So the fantasy in psychiatry has been, as in the rest of medicine, we're gonna to move to an era of personalized medicine. And I think there's been some notable success, particularly in cancer, in saying we did the genetic test, Receptor positive patients respond well, receptor negative don't. Cancer is a wonderful illustration of personalized medicine. The clinician fantasy in psychiatry might look something like this uh, very clunky bootstrapped interface that says, patient comes in, here's a reasonable first choice, here's a reasonable second and third choice. Oh, and by the way, we have a few different experts, you can choose the one you, you like the best. This is what people think they want. Um, I'm going to argue that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, first of all, because we tend to be very focused on first-line antidepressants. What do we do first? Someone comes in the clinic, they're depressed, we need to choose an intervention, we might offer them a cognitive behavioral therapy, a non-pharmacologic strategy, but more often than not, people say, you know what, I'm too busy or I can't get CBT, and we end up offering a medication. The current state of practice in psychiatry is what you might call artisanal psychopharmacology. We look at the patient and we rely on our clinical judgment and we think, you know what? This person looks like someone who needs to be on fluoxetine. Ah, this feels like a venlafaxine patient. And my favorite description of artisanal psychopharmacology actually comes from Greg Simon, uh, Group Health. And Greg says, I love eating artisanal bread, right? You go into the bakery and each day is different. You know, a little more salt, a little less salt. They cooked it a little longer, a little shorter. You never quite know what you're gonna get. And that variation is exactly what makes the bread so good. On the other hand, I'm not so sure that I want to fly on an artisanal airplane. <laughs> and right now in psychiatry, we ask our patients to fly on artisanal airplanes, which is to say, we generate, there's a huge amount of variability in practice. Now, the message of STAR-D, which was a landmark antidepressant study done now more than a decade ago, that enrolled patients followed them, randomized them to next step treatments, was actually that the treatment selection, the randomized treatment was less important than time on treatment. So sometimes people make fun of STAR-D because what STAR-D mostly showed was we randomized people to a bunch of different interventions for a second treatment, third, fourth, and it didn't matter which treatment was selected. But another way of looking at STAR-D was the longer we could keep people on some treatment, right, as long as we kept them engaged, the more likely we could get them well, okay? By the way, this is an important distinction from saying that antidepressants don't work. 
Okay, we have abundant evidence that antidepressants consistently work better than placebo. And the reference, just because I cite it so often, uh, most recently is work by Andrea Cipriani in The Lancet last year, where he did a network meta-analysis, looked at all of the standard antidepressants against placebo and against each other. And the punchline is antidepressants consistently work better than placebo. The effect sizes are certainly larger for moderate depression and severe depression, but mild to moderate depression antidepressants work as well. Just the risk-benefit uh, decision may be a little bit different. When we think about guiding antidepressant treatment, however, um, you need to think a little bit, take a page from the decision analysis field and beware of dominating choices. So beware of circumstances where even if you had something that added some information to your treatment decision making, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a better algorithm. So we did this thought exercise a few years ago. There was a, a single variant, a single gene published uh, that was suggested to improve, um, or to identify people more likely to respond to SSRIs. Now it turns out, as in much of genetics for the first decade, it was a false positive, wasn't real, but that doesn't matter. Do the thought experiment with me. We said, if I had a predictor of who was gonna do better on antidepressant, um, or on a particular antidepressant, an SSRI, where would I integrate that in treatment? Would I incorporate that before my initial treatment or after someone had failed one treatment? And I'll make a very long story short and say in detailed cost effectiveness analysis, we were actually just better off doing systematic, standardized, give someone a first SSRI. If they don't get better with the first SSRI, give them a second SSRI. Okay, so beware of dominating choices. We really need to look for situations in psychiatry and in depression where our decision support tools might move the dial. And I would suggest to you that it's probably not first line treatment of depression where we do reasonably well. So be sure you're looking at the right phenotype and in particular, don't lose sight of the fact that while antidepressants work, they don't work for everyone. So with an initial antidepressant treatment, I can get about a third of people to remission. With subsequent treatments, I can get maybe another third to remission. But that leaves about a third of people where despite multiple systematically administered, adequately dosed medication or psychotherapy trials, I have trouble getting them out of their depression. And by the way, what this figure from STAR-D also shows was that the more trials it takes for me to get someone well, the more likely they are to get sick again. So for people in the audience who might be thinking about working in depression and studying outcomes in depression, we very much need your help, but I hope I can convince at least some of you to maybe think less about first-line treatment and more about longer-term treatment, both in terms of helping people who are, or identifying people who are at high risk for treatment resistance, who might need more aggressive um, uh, interventions earlier, or at least earlier psychiatric consultation, and think about how we can do better at predicting long-term outcomes. Because again, the question that comes up constantly in my practice is, congratulations, you're feeling better, now what? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? It's probably the question I get asked most often. I don't ever want to feel like that again, what can I do? And I have precious little data to offer them. And by the way, this is an area where I don't have good clinical trial data because almost all of our RCTs are short term, but I have decades plus of longitudinal electronic health record data that could be leveraged to solve this problem. Um, I've talked a lot about treatments being similar and being more important to keep people on treatment, I should emphasize that we also need newer and better treatments. There's a lot of enthusiasm right now about S-ketamine, uh, really a, just a patentable form of ketamine, which was the original drug to show benefit in um, acute treatment of depression over the last few years. I think there's a whole, there's a next generation of antidepressants out there. My own group is working very hard in cellular models, trying to identify um, next step treatments for depression and schizophrenia and so forth. So a lot of what I'm talking to you about has to do with standard antidepressants that go back really to science from the 80s. 
But even with this new generation of treatments, we're going to need help in figuring out who gets those um, costlier, more, less well tolerated, more complex to administer treatments early versus late. So again, we need help identifying people uh, who should be triaged to more aggressive early treatment, which is not so different from a lot of other diseases. All right, um, maybe the most controversial thing I'm gonna tell you today uh, has to do with predicting suicide risk. Now, suicide research is an appealing topic on a lot of levels. Um, it is rare in objective terms, but incredibly tragic when 20-somethings or 30-somethings die. Um, and when they die of something that is seen as imminently preventable. Uh, I cannot convey to you how terrible it feels to stand at the funeral of a 30-something who is getting ready to go off to graduate school uh, or getting ready to go get his MBA and is, has, has died by suicide. It is a terror. I would not wish it on anyone. Uh, it, it's a horrible feeling, matched probably only by how his family feels and how he felt. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's at, a, at a limbic level, at a visceral level, we, we feel like this is something valuable to work on. Um, from a logistics perspective, it's also appealing because unlike much of what we study in the electronic health record in psychiatry, it's a hard outcome, right? We can argue about what the codes mean and so on, but mortality is mortality. Um, and there's been a lot of increased attention recently, which I think in, in, on balance is a very good thing to, um, to suicide and suicide risk. So I think in terms of encouraging people to seek help, um, reducing stigma, that's all well and good. Uh, it is certainly true that uh, suicide is a major contributor to death. This is uh, CDC data among individuals 25 to 34 from a couple of years ago. And you can see in the bar graph that it's the second leading cause of death. Um, second only, by the way, to accidents or unintentional injuries. Now, it's quite likely that some of what we call accidents is actually suicide. And often in our own work, we study suicide and accidental death together because not necessarily able to reliably distinguish those two in all cases. Um, so purely from a what disease can I, or what outcome can I work on that impacts relatively young people who would otherwise potentially live many, many more years, um, it's, it's an appealing topic and it's an important one. Um, Parenthetically, particularly in light of recent events, I do want to call your attention to what is the third leading cause of death in this age group, which is homicide. Um, there is a lack of will at the moment to study or to fund at a federal level research into firearms and firearm-related death, but that doesn't mean we can't do it with electronic health records and claims and so forth. So uh, just a brief commercial to not forget about our ability to look at things like assault and firearms. Um, so certainly it is possible to predict suicide and accidental death. We've done it, many other groups have done it. This is some work again from Tom McCoy a few years ago, uh, drawing on natural language processing. So we can build prediction models. They perform reasonably well, at least well enough to get published in clinical journals. Um, but I would tell you that I think we have sort of a, a problem here. One problem is that most people with psychiatric illness aren't going to die by suicide. Most of them are gonna die of something else, and they're going to be at an elevated risk of dying of that something else almost across the board. So this is just, for illustrative purposes, this is some data from my hospital system looking at uh, causes of death a few years ago. And while having a psychiatric illness absolutely increases your magnitude of risk for suicide and for accidental death, as we know, it also increases risk of death from cancer, from heart disease, from stroke. And so if your interest is in reducing mortality among people with psychiatric illness, there's a whole range of diseases or outcomes to study. For example, one of the major reasons you see this elevation is smoking. You wanna decrease mortality in psychiatric illness, figure out a way to get people to stop smoking. 
the other concern in predicting suicide is that it is fundamentally a stochastic process. It's a little bit like saying, can you predict thunderstorms versus lightning strikes? So we actually made huge strides in predicting where there will be thunderstorms, where there is the potential for lightning, in the same way that most of our models, even circa three or four years ago, do pretty well in identifying who are high-risk populations. When you delve into the weeds of these models, they tend to be incredibly disappointing in the sense that they tell you stuff like, people who are depressed are at elevated risk. People who have made a prior attempt are at elevated risk. People who abuse drugs and alcohol are at elevated risk. People who are less engaged with the health system are often at elevated risk. Not that that's not useful, but I think we need to shift our focus a little bit and realize it's very hard to predict suicide attempts. Perhaps a more tractable problem is to predict high-risk populations. Um, so we can figure out who are high-risk individuals, but we need to be realistic about the fact that the majority of people at high risk for suicide, fortunately, don't die by suicide. I also think there's some work to be done in predicting high-risk periods. We'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, but I worry that these zero suicide initiatives that people talk about give a little bit of, uh, they can be counterproductive because they give a little bit of a false sense of our ability to predict and treat. So I can make predictions about things like, is there going to be a thunderstorm? And I know within that thunderstorm, there are likely to be lightning strikes. But if my goal is to say which tree is going to get hit by lightning, or which person is gonna get hit by lightning, I think that's a difficult kind of problem, and at least right now, probably um, not something that we're well positioned to solve. So if you wanna decrease mortality in psychiatric illness, figure out a way to get people to stop smoking. If you wanna decrease suicide, I'd also encourage you to think about helping to solve the other piece of the problem, which is better treatments because the reality in 2019, despite the abundance of progress, both on the clinical side and on the biological side, is that other than dragging people off to the hospital, in the very near term, there is very little we can do. Now, hospitalizing someone who's at high risk is a reasonable strategy if, if necessary, um, but it doesn't really solve the underlying problem. Better antidepressants and uh, antidepressant strategies and psychotherapies and other uh, levels of care, I think in the long run are what will help us solve this problem. I don't know if you've ever picked up a journal or looked at a meeting proceedings or walked by a poster and said, oh crap, I wanted to do that. Um, but I wanted to show you a site from a paper that, that where I had that experience. So I'd been intending to write a simulation paper that looked at suicide prediction and showed that because our positive predictive values are so low, none of them were really ready for clinical deployment or really much better than standard suicide screens. And so we went back and forth about what's the best way to do the simulation, where do we get the parameters and so on. In the meantime, these guys took the published suicide models and more or less did the same thing and said, look, none of these are ready for clinical application. So again, it's not that I don't think suicide is an important problem, it's a critically important problem. But in, in terms of getting, uh, encouraging people to think about different ways of approaching it, think about how can we make interventions that are more scalable, how can we better target our interventions, but recognize the limitations of our ability to identify an individual who is going to make a suicide attempt. All right, just to close in the last couple minutes, I wanted to um, say a word or two about getting beyond electronic health records in studying psychiatric illness um, as a group that's spent uh, much of the last decade or so looking at working with electronic health records. Um, just a few points to make as it pertains to psychiatry. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but remember that the coded data you get in an EHR and certainly in an administrative data set comes from a busy doc or a coding specialist who really doesn't care that you want to do research. They don't care, that's not their job. Their job is to check a box so the hospital or the clinic can get paid for the work that they did. Doesn't mean they're not conscientious physicians, doesn't mean they're not systematic. They're three patients behind, they're 45 minutes behind, they're checking a box or clicking a button and moving on. 
So sometimes I hear people say, what we really need to do is get clinicians to be more conscientious in, in coding diagnosis. Good luck with that. <laughs> On the other hand, what we have learned and, and uh, others in the group, narrative notes really can enhance your ability to make predictions. And while a lot of the important information related to psychiatric disease features is not captured by diagnostic codes, it's in the notes. The docs are thinking about it. They're writing it down. You just have to do the work to pull it out. What we've learned over the years is that you're not necessarily going to get out the individual diagnostic features that you need to recapitulate the diagnosis. On the other hand, you will get useful predictive features. So you may have to dig a little bit. You may have to be clever in how you go about it. Even though we're not focused on checking that box for you, we are focused on recording the clinical information that we think we need so that the next time we see someone, we can continue to provide good care. Nonetheless, I think recognizing the limitations of electronic health records, there's enthusiasm now for what you might call EHR plus studies. So how can we augment the EHR with other data streams? And a couple of those strategies include integrating electronic health records with legal or financial data streams. So what do I know about how this person functions outside of the health system? And then links from electronic health records to other passive data streams that people have talked about up here. In the former case, linking health records to legal or financial documents, I would just remind you, I took an oath to first do no harm. And something that we as a community in, in machine learning do need to think about is how easy it is to re-identify electronic health records data. And that we need to think long and hard about, do we want to create these honeypots that not only have detailed electronic health record data, but also financial and legal data? Do we want to put all of that in one place? And the reality is we're going to do these things, but uh, this is, uh, paper that Tom and I, Tom McCoy and I wrote uh, last year in, in JAMA that just quantifies the risk associated with data breach. So be aware, the, the problem with doing research on this scale is that it gives us the opportunity to harm not an individual patient in front of us, but potentially hundreds of thousands of patients at the same time. So um, there's a fair amount of responsibility that comes with that, as you all know. Um, then in terms of other data streams that we might integrate with electronic health records, just for historical interest, this was one of the first efforts that I know of to um, collect passive data from cell phones. It was built by uh, ourselves and folks at the MIT Media Lab around 2003. It was the first, one of the first uh, phones that could run Java. We called it High Roller. We thought we could use it to follow bipolar symptoms. It never really went anywhere, um, but fun to think about how long these ideas sometimes take to percolate to reality. This is some more recent data from earlier this year uh, where we used uh, any of um, an, an open source app to collect passive clinical data. The reason to show it to you here is we gave this phone app to a bunch of patients across disorders. And we were interested in understanding how well we could capture depressive symptoms. And the punchline is that passive data is incredibly promising in, in augmenting what we get from electronic health records, but it's fundamentally different from a clinician assessment. So the left panel here compares a clinician rating, so a clinician sitting there doing an assessment, to patient self-report. So y-axis here is the clinician score. Uh, sorry, x-axis clinician score, y-axis the predicted score based on uh, the patient's self-report. And then the panel on the other side is purely relying on passive measures. And the point here is they're correlated-ish, but it's not as though the passive data is going to replace the clinical assessment. You might look at that as a bug, but I actually am inclined to look at that as a feature. We're collecting this incredible data set that's not quite orthogonal to the clinical assessment, but it is capturing different features. So the hope is that by integrating these passive measures with the electronic health records, we can actually get a more comprehensive picture to use to build better predictors. 
This is not rocket science. Um, the simple discovery in, in the case of frosted flakes was that toasting the flakes gave them a great flavor. That was the simple discovery here. The, the simple discovery that I hope some of you will take away from this is please study psychiatric illness. Please study depression. Massive need. Very tractable to the methods that folks are talking about here. It really is not fuzzier, at least as reflected in coded data. You really can do this work. You really can model outcomes. Um, thanks very much. All right, we have time for a few questions. In the meantime, uh, the spotlight presenters for uh, papers 16 and up, please form a queue over here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. It struck my heart because it reminds me of my friend who died of uh, depression about a couple years ago. Uh, it's quite a sad event where when we first, when we, when we know her symptoms, right, we try to uh, encourage her to engage with uh, uh, a psychiatrist. Um, however, she feel like there are some side effects. She want to discontinue the medication. And then about, uh, about two weeks later, he, she passed away. So that's a very sad event. And, and myself was not very closely following her up. However, a friend in church followed her uh, very, very well weekly. And from her uh, assessment of this uh, friend, she said, um, this, ep this epoch is very bad epoch for her. It's probably the worst among her, all her past depression experience. So I'm thinking, uh, when we use data, uh, build our models to predict a very tragic event like uh, suicide, um, as you mentioned, there may be other data stream to augmenting that. And the, the experience I had with that church friend, maybe if we can monitor those depression patients more closely, we can get more data about that patient, maybe more able to predict when the patient go and commit suicide? So uh, I'm sorry about your friend. It, it is, you know, people die of depression. I think the way that you, the way you framed it is exactly right and important to remember. Um, so I'm actually most enthusiastic about passive data for monitoring individual patients because I do think we see rather substantial shifts in behavior before people are, or when people are at highest risk for suicide. And of course, you know, to some extent, that's the sort of thing that Facebook was trying to do, but in a very clunky way. Um, so I think what's frustrating to me is I don't need an iPhone app that tells me that someone has depression. I don't think we should be trying to build machines that do what any human being is very good at, right? So it doesn't take a lot of clinical training to recognize that someone is struggling, may not make a diagnosis. So uh, that's why I'm not enthusiastic about, you know, will a phone be able to tell me I'm depressed? What I am enthusiastic about though is my phone knows what is normal behavior for me. And so recognizing that I have stopped making calls as frequently or I've stopped leaving the house as much, the sorts of things that often do precede an attempt. Or conversely, by the way, given heter how heterogeneous depression is, that I've become more active, right? That I have psychomotor agitation, I'm, I'm agitated, which can be a risk factor for, for suicide. So I, I think you're right that um, there are, it's not that there are not signs that someone's at high risk, but I think we need to match the population level prediction we can do with electronic health records with more individual level predict prediction that looks at changes in someone's behavior over time. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, thank Hi. you for such an incredible talk. I have so many questions for you, but I will try to limit to, to just one here. I read a paper of yours that was relating the uh, domains of RDOC to suicide risk, and I was just wondering if you could comment a bit more on that and if you have uh, more ideas of, um, of how we could be using RDOC in predicting uh, psychiatric dimensions. Sure. Um, so the, the question relates to what NIMH has called the research domain criteria or RDOC criteria, which are these five dimensions of uh, brain phenomenology, now six, they added one, um, that 
they've encouraged uh, people to develop new research modalities that target each of these individual domains, right? So you can, we, we think of it as take an individual and project them into this five-dimensional space and you can sort of, you know, try to unpack some of the heterogeneity in psychiatric illness and other brain diseases. Um, what we tried to do was just take narrative clinical notes and try to parse them into those five dimensions. And we did this in part because when RDOC was first elaborated by NIMH, there actually was no, there's arguably to some extent, are not standard ways of assessing each domain in an individual. Um, so we've tried very hard to uh, focus on strategies that let us learn as much as we can from the notes. So I have sort of tipped my hand here. Um, we have some subsequent work that looks at features of personality and personality disorders, um, uh, other kinds of symptoms like agitation. I think that's the, the direction that we're going is really trying to get at that heterogeneity and hope that those engineered features help us make better predictions. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you had looked into how much um, sort of surveillance on social networks and things like that could potentially help us with this lightning strike problem. I think it, it um, there's no question that it could help. I think it boils down to how, how and in what context we would deploy those kinds of interventions. So again, Facebook got a lot of bad press for being a little bit ham-handed in how it was identifying suicide risk. You know, the, the problem with all of our prediction models in a nutshell is, high, is the PPV is too low. Positive predictive value is too low. And you know, I can't be sending, it is incredibly traumatic to have the EMTs or the police come to your house and drag you off to the hospital, right? It's, it's a horrible thing. I have patients who are more traumatized by that experience of involuntary hospitalization than by any of the other horrible things that, that happen to them. So I think what, what I'm in favor of are more sort of opt-in strategies where someone who has a diagnosis of depression or substance or some other diagnosis that puts them at elevated risk could decide, you know what, I'm going to opt into this kind of thing. And, you know, I understand that that means that there may be circumstances. I mean, ideally, we don't want to get to the point where you've got the EMTs knocking on your door. Ideally, you want to get to the point where you notice a small enough change that the nurse practitioner calls or the psychiatrist calls or the social worker calls and says, hey, something's going on, what's up? Right now, we don't have that infrastructure. and. So beyond the machine learning, a lot of what we need to do is build the infrastructure that enables the machine learning to be used in a way that is practical. Yep. Um, I have a question about suicide predictability. Um, you know, your idea about capturing passive data. I wonder what time frame are you looking at? Because, you know, we, ask, we have a lot of talk on sepsis here and, you know, predicting sepsis eight hours before sepsis happens. Is, are you looking at within our time frame? And the second thing is, how do you capture suicidal ideation through passive data? So I'm, um, I'm not sure about, pa about suicidal ideation on passive per se. You know, my, I never forget that, you know, I, when I was training, um, I, one, one of my supervisors said, it's very easy for me to diagnose depression. I, I look at my patients and I say, are you depressed? And, you know, we laugh, but that's actually a, not a bad way to start. So for suicidal ideation, I'm in favor of asking people. Um, I can collect that data point relatively easily. You can get fancier. Um, there's all sorts of ways of looking at cognitive biases and so on. Um, but what I think the passive data is most useful for is assessing the risk factors that can uh, precede an attempt an increase in, in agitation, uh, social withdrawal, you know, this, the sorts of things that I think can be hours to days before. So to your initial question, I think we're still working on the order of days, um, but the hope is to become, you know, to, to shorten that time frame as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thanks again.